Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India come uh, to a very interesting juncture in uh, this journey of trying to understand the history of economic thought. Um, we started by saying that every science is a set of universals within the framework of its own methodology, within the framework of its own scope, it pronounces a set of universals about the state of the universe. Whether it is physics, or chemistry each has its own universals about this world and so too does economics. We started this quest on how this the universals of economics, modern economics came to be what they are and we started the quest way back in time with how universals were anyway articulated at the time of Greeks. We found two important factors at that time leading to the possibility of universals one is faith arising out of uncertainty and insecurity. Faith simply postulates a permanent eternal and attributes everything that happens which is transitory to the eternal. That is the early form of the statement of the universals. In the Greeks you found also running parallelly after a while a preoccupation with universals from a speculative point of view, from a scientific point of view, from a philosophical point of view too. So, these two things coincide and by the time of Plato, the two are merged. In Plato, the universals coming from faith and the universals coming from speculation and inquiry are merged. In a sense, therefore, you can say Plato is the apogee of the development of Greek thought in another sense you can say is the ultimate downfall of Greek thought, because many things which were autonomous and independent about the speculative tr uh, traditions among the Greeks lost their way in Plato. Either way, the early universals were like that, but in the writings of Aristotle we find certainly the earliest statements about economics. Economics in Aristotle was considered to be a household science or science concerned with the behavior of households, how they conduct the household economy. And you find that this preoccupation with economics of the household goes right on through a long, long time after Aristotle. It goes on till the 13th, 14th century AD in the writings of the scholastics. In St. Thomas Aquinas, for instance, you find economics pretty much as Aristotle had stated it long, long ago. Economics is all about how you run a household. And economics is also a lot of moralization as it happened in Aristotelian tradition. Moralization about making money for money's sake, it is there in Aquinas as much as it is in Aristotle. So, from the household, economics moves to political economy, when the mercantilists come into prominence. The mercantilists come into prominence, you know, when the mercantile revolution is sweeping, sweeping across Europe, when the towns are growing at, and the villages and the countryside and feudalism in general all declining, the rise of modern nation states where the rising monarchic powers or collaborating with the merchants in the cities and formulating policies for the nation, which are essentially policies for the well-being of the merchants in the mercantile revolution. So, for the first time, economics becomes political economy or rather for the first time, the economics of the household becomes political economy. Political economy because it concerns the political future of a nation. Also, it concerns the political future of a particular very dynamic and active class of people, the mercantile groups. This goes on till the dispute over mercantilism comes to stay by the time Smith is writing 
Home is writing. But by then, political economy is, has come to stay. It is no longer the realm to be dominated by mercantile class, but in Smith, Ricardo, Malthus and all of them, there is a clear formulation of the society as consisting of three groups of people, the capitalists, the landowners and the workers. So, that is the domain of political economy. And those are all the, so what Ricardo was writing were the universals of political economy at that time and so too in the theory of exploitation of Karl Marx. By the 1870s when Marx was publishing his works also occurs a tremendous explosive outpouring of marginalist writing, neoclassical writing, three great marginalist economists right at that time, Jevons, Menger and Walras. All three produced classics. Walrasian work of course, is recognized at least 15 years after he wrote it. But needless to say, all three are considered pioneering works in neoclassical economics. It is not as if this neoclassical economics and marginalist ideas, ideas of utility did not come earlier. We saw for instance that Galliano, Curno, Dupuy, they were all talking about utilities, they were all talking about markets, they were all talking about efficiencies, but it did not pick up as the writings of Jevons, Menger and Walras picked up. In the 1880s, there was the next generation of marginalist writers who were so numerous and so vociferous in their support of this idea of looking at economics, that neoclassical economics had come to stay. So, what was the reason why all this happened? What is the story of the coming into existence of neoclassical economics? We can say from the time of Jevons, Menger and Walras in the 1870s till the completion of the works of Marx, I am sorry Marshall in the first decade of the 20th century, the neoclassical revolution in economics was complete. What is most important? What is most important? It is no longer political economy, it is economics. Why is it economics? The best answer is found in Marshall. Marshall writes a very interesting book called Industrial, Econom Industrial Economics in collaboration with his wife Mary Marshall where he says, it is time to call this economics, because all public and political interests must be severed from the pursuit of economics. It has nothing to do with any party, it, it has nothing to do with any political interest, it has nothing to do with any other vested interest, in other words nothing political about it. It is a pure science. It is a pure science of allocation of resources, it is a pure science about how scarcity is resolved. In short, economics in its modern terms and the modern universals of economics as we know it arrived in these 40 years. So, what was it that made for this success? The first of course, was that the one thing on which classical political economy was hanging on to all the time tenaciously and not very efficiently labor theory of value, it gave way at last. The person who probably swore most by labor theory of value was Ricardo, but the person who refined it to the finest possible extent was Marx. But either way by 19, by 1870s, the preoccupation of economics had become different they were no longer concerned with labor theory, they were concerned with exchange values. We saw for instance that the advent of say drew people's and people's attention away from absolutes such as embodied labor and so on and so forth. Any absolute value at all in economics was not taken seriously after say. Say said it is exchange values that is it, they are all there and you study how the system works on that basis. 
So, labor theory of value was done with not so much as a tool of analysis, but with the idea of some absolute that there must be some absolute indicator of value in economics that notion went with the eclipse of labor theory of value and with the rise of this new brand of economics which was concerned with markets and equilibria. Hmm. The second thing or the third thing is the absence of a viable theory of income distribution in classical political economy. All of them were talking about landowners and uh, capitalists and workers and almost all of them were preoccupied endlessly with why labor was getting and should be getting only subsistence wage. By the time Mill was writing, it had rigidified into why there should be a single wage, wage bill for the whole country. In short, they were preoccupied tremendously with why labor should get subsistence wage, but they failed to ask what was the rationale of capitalists getting their profits, what was the rationale of landlords getting their rent. There was a quarrel between Malthus and Ricardo on that of course, on which Ricardo was categorical in saying that it is only a differential surplus that rent is. It does not figure in the cost of production and therefore, does not figure in the price and so forth. In short, it is something like bakshish. The landlords hold the land and for the privilege of holding the land, when there is growth in the economy, the rent increases and that is what the landlords get. So, there was no theory of distribution as to how a certain number of rupees of national income would be distributed into different people's share. What is the aggregate theory of distribution here? Classical political economy lacked this. Marx had a tremendous theory of distribution. In Marx, the theory of production and distribution went hand in hand. There were two faces of the same coin. You, you toss the coin, it falls on head, it is theory of distribution. Falls on tails, it is the theory of production. That is how rigorous and refined Marx's analysis was, but Marx was Marxism was facing its own problems slightly later, but the question at this point in time is classical political economy barring Marx had no viable theory of distribution and that led to the loss of interest in that. Finally, Marxism itself displaced a large part of classical political economy, although Marx was a classical political economist himself. But attention was drawn away from a whole lot of people including Ricardo and Malthus and even Smith. So, the rise of Marxism constituted a distraction away from older classical political economy, especially older theories of growth and distribution. And finally, the world of capitalists the world of urban middle classes which were growing very strongly in the second half of 19th century, the world of the urban bourgeoisie who were all continuously feeling insecure by the growth of the workers movement across the world. And there was an answer needed to the claims made by Marxism which so fascinated everybody including the workers you are getting 100 rupees that is because that is what you can get under the exploitation by capitalists finished. Everybody who is discontented, who is uh, disenchanted is satisfied with that explanation that somebody is exploiting him. Could there be a scientific theory outside of ideological biases, outside of political uh, implications which could scientifically explain the occurrence of distribution of income? There was a quest for this and neoclassical economics provided this. The marginal productivity theory of distribution provided this answer. So, this is another reason why neoclassicism was significant. So, what was central in neoclassical economics which made it so powerful an approach to economics? Neoclassical neo economists were not concerned anymore with growth distribution. They acknowledged, it, they acknowledged that these problems were important, but they said central problem is the allocation of resources. How does it happen and what ensures efficiency? And then they were increasingly concerned with only one thing. They said even 
allocation of resources becomes secondary to the problem of studying how human beings coped with scarcity. Lionel Robbins put the temper of the times very accurately when he said economics is a relationship between ends and scarce means which have alternative uses. In other words, the whole preoccupation of the subject had narrowed down to this one single issue which was virtually the paradigm of the whole subject. So, in a sense if universals was what economics was tending to the paradigm of scarcity is the ultimate universal to which you could think in terms of. And then it had a very comfortable legacy from utilitarianism, not just utilitarianism from the time of Galliano, ben, Bentham, Dupuy, Cournot, all of them were followers of utilitarianism of one variety or other. Most important was the, the idea of utility constituted the backdrop to the whole notion of not only demand, but also even supply. So, utilitarianism was not just a part of the conceptual framework of neoclassical economics, but virtually became the creed finally. To look upon economic problem as a problem of choice among alternative uses of resources became central to this neoclassical school of thought. By the time Marshall was writing 1895 when Marshall's principles were published, economists had come to accept that resources were not only usable among multiple wants, but they were substitutable to satisfy these wants. In short, the, not just the problem of scarcity, but the problem of choice among alternatives a choice which was reversible because if you made a mistake once you would need do not need to make that mistake again you could correct your choice and make a better alternate better cho choose better alternatives the next time. So, and rationality it is not that rationality was accepted as a single rule of thumb by people. Economist Jevons, for instance, did accept that there was altruism in people, there was concern for the others in people, but all these took a second place compared to the rationality in people, and this rationality was the tendency of people to maximize the returns under constraint. This rationality acquired three meanings by the end of the 19th century or by early 20th century, when by the time Marshall rain in Cambridge was complete, these three types of implications of rationality became very uniform. One is ends rationality that is I should achieve what I need to achieve at the shortest expenditure of resources that is under constraints maximize your returns that is ends rationality. Means rationality is looking at the same thing in terms of cost saving achieve something at the minimum cost is means rationality and finally, that the whole choice behavior should be a part of a of a philosophical belief which appears to be scientific. Rationality is accepted not just because it is a good rule of thumb for maximization of returns or minimization of cost, but also because it is scientific way of looking at things. So, belief rationality. So, by the time of uh, the end of Marshall, Marshall's reign in Cambridge, these three aspects of rationality had come to be accepted across the world by economists. What is more, a number of early economists, early marginalist or neoclassical economists were also trained in mathematics. Some of them, like Jevons, had been trained by people who were excellent physicists, but great in mathematics too. So, all these inspirations led economists to believe that economics could be like physics subject to universal laws, subject to rigorous mathematical analysis. In short, economics was thought of as the physics of social sciences. This also came to be 
So, even the mathematics at the time of Jevons and Walras was far too advanced for common people to follow, but by the time Fisher was writing mathematics in America, a lot of the mathematics written by Fisher was beyond the comprehension of most of his colleagues. So, that was how central mathematics became. Not so much because mathematics was functionally useful, mathematics was functionally useful absolutely, but more importantly mathematics symbolized the idea that you were doing things scientifically, that you were rigorous and therefore, you were being scientific. So, mathematics became a kind of a value for economics by 1920s this had come to be and by the time of writing of Fisher himself by in the 1930s you had formulations which were early econometrics in the writings of Fisher. Finally, a theory of value which had nothing to do with absolutes, it was just a subjective theory of value. People are pleasure seekers, so when they consume objects, the objects have capability of satisfying the, the, the need for pleasure in the person, this capability is called utility. So, subjective theory of value and interpersonal utility cannot be compared, your utility from eating one samosa is different from say um, Aditi's uh, pleasure from eating samosa, you cannot compare it. So, subjective theory of value and finally, as Marshall was to say economics had become liberated from the rule of interest groups and political interests and so forth, economics was a science and then welfare for the first time after the writings of Pareto and uh, Walras became central criterion. It is not surprising that uh, Pareto succeeded Walras as the head in the uh, in the uh, what is that Luz Lucerne school, no what is the school in, in uh, uh, in Switzerland or which Walras was heading, it will come to me, it will come to me. So, it was not an uh, it was not an accident that Pareto succeeded Walras, because once again how much of Walrasian thought was already in Pareto and how much of Paretian optimum was already in the writings of Walras, these are all borderline areas which are very distinct, very difficult to distinguish from. But what is most important is the coming into existence of welfare economics brought into the reckoning in the subject, ways of judging effects on the public of policies of activities based on rigorous methodology. So, you could analyze the welfare effects of a particular policy of a party or a particular activity on the public or on the society using the same rigorous tools of analysis as you studied the market. So, this was the coming of neoclassical economics and this was the revolution, neoclassical revolution. Now, let us look at developments that happened around this, because while I said neoclassical revolution was complete by, uh, by 1920s, it is far from truth when I say if I were to say that there is nothing more done after this. In fact, the paradigm of scarcity, the paradigm of efficiency and the use of mathematics they continue to create newer and newer and newer applications, newer and newer developments in the subject. I will discuss with you some of these developments. Let us talk of Pigouvian externalities. Do you know what externalities are? Yeah, Avantika. The bystander is not a part of the market. Um, Pigou was very tight when he argued this point. Can you think of that? It is very simple. In fact, I think one of you did mention it in an earlier class once. What about private and public, private and social costs? So, what about, what about that? I mean, how does it bring in externalities? Then it is. It is creating externality. It's creating the externality, and you need to only pay the tax. Okay. So all are all externalities only creating harmful effects. No, it's 
So, social cost can be both higher and lower than private costs. The important thing is that there is a difference between social and private costs caused by externalities. No? So, this is Picovian externalities. Have I talked to you about Cosian externalities? I think I have. Person, you are tickled. Okay, it does not matter from where you uh, what is Coase theorem. Externalities happen. You uh, you assign property rights to get rid of externalities. Yeah, get rid of external property rights. And there's, efficiently. Well, there's a clear definition of property rights. The markets can find a way to efficiently. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Did we discuss some example about this? I think this might have been an example given by Coase himself. That's no, mead. That's not Cosian external. That's that's externality in general. Yeah, Krishna, you were saying something. Discuss the example of a baker and a doctor. Right, lovely, lovely. So, what was this about? Recovery of patients in the Recovery hospital. Of the services provided by the doctor basically, so. so, what was the issue here? Both had proper titles to their properties. It yeah, is. So if the doctor has uh, titles to the property, he can uh, tell the baker to go away, for example. Or if the baker has. No, but it depends on. Law yeah, it depends on who owns, uh, who has the titles. No, and the loss caused to each person. Yeah. Mm. So, what do you do about the loss? Sure, why not? So After all, neoclassical economics uses maths. That's what we, we have said yeah. all the time. So, uh, if the baker's uh, gain is ten units from um, from his activity, which involves the sum, and the loss for the doctor for the corresponding sum is twenty-five units, and uh, 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 and if the um, um, yeah, if the baker were to own the uh, property, uh, then uh, the doctor would be willing to pay the baker uh, the amount of loss that uh, he would have to forego for uh, or the amount of gain that he would have to forego in order to shut down. What is that amount called? Uh, Isn't it called compensation? Ah, compensation. Hmm? So, it is not so much the tight definition of property loss. But it is the payment of composition for inconvenience incurred, is not it? Because the whole uh, examples of course, repeatedly come and tell you they are all from uh, court disputes in the US, all his data. So, what he is saying is you might have the tightest well defined control over your property, you might say I have this, I have that, I have this. But still, when you start using this property, you might start creating hindrance to somebody else without intending to do so at all. So, he says it is inherent in property that it need not always be used without a social cost. Hmm? What is important is when there is a hindrance, a compensation should be paid by the person who creates the hindrance, then the problem is solved. So, the determination of this compensation is what the Cosian cost is all about, no? but it is not all that simple. How do you decide the compensation? Pani? Okay. 
See, what you're saying is uh, something like what Avantika said. She said, uh, "I've cost you a 15 rupee damage for my 10 rupee profit. So I have to, whether I'm making a loss or a profit, I have to give you 15 rupees as a compensation for the damage that you suffered." Right? I'm saying, is there all there is to that in social costs? Is there something more? Who decides the compromise? Who tells you what the compensation should be? Where do you go to resolve that? Who? The How many? Markets, the markets resolve it because of, uh, as in after the, uh, uh, if the loss is 15 or 25, mm -hmm. then after that point, uh, that level, the uh, maker or the doctor is will, uh, willing to adjust. Uh, how do you mean billing? How market? How do market sort it out? Is what I'm asking you. But you know, my it will happen like this. I'll tell you. You're the doctor, and I'm the baker. Let us say, and uh, you come to me and say, "Hey, baker, baker, I have lost 15 bucks because of you." And I say, "Doctor, doctor, how did you lose 15 bucks?" And then you say, well, you know, um, uh, you started pounding the wheat to make a flour and then one of my patients breathed his last in the intensive care ward and that cost me 15 rupees. So, oh, and I say, how oh, sad, poor thing, my, my condolences. So, then you say, hey, Baker, I do not want your condolences, I want a bit more than that. And then I say, oh, because I sense what is coming. Say, oh, oh, really? You want something more than that? Then, yeah. I want 15 bucks because I have suffered a loss of 15 bucks because of all the trouble that your, uh, your pounding machines have created. Now, you better give me 15 rupees. Now, I am not so much interested in condolences, no. I am interested in saving my 15 bucks. So I say, no, no, no. Why should I give you 15 rupees? How do you know your patient did not die out of any other reason? How do, how do I know that you did not neglect him? How do I know that he did not jump off the window? I, know, I do not know anything about how your patients died. Why should I give you 15 rupees? Now, at this point, tell me, Avantika, how does market resolve this? No, my point is more in terms of since the doctor knows that his loss is to the effect, to the tune of so much, he is willing to pay up to uh, no. no, the doctor, doctor wants 15 bucks. No, I'm the saying baker that. has to pay 15 bucks. Yeah, but he is. Willing to compensate the baker for if he in future at least would shut down, right? That that is the uh Oh, the then, oh, oh, that is not 15 bucks. He's, uh, he has to buy up the baker. The baker has to relocate. Yeah. Uh, Isn't it? It might be possible. It might be possible. What you're saying is the doctor might say, well, look, I'm suffering 15 rupee loss, so well. Uh, I know that he paid 100 rupees for this plot of land, I will give him 115 rupees to cover up the whole problem. That is what you are saying, the market provides enough indicators. Yeah, as in the, uh, it, it would reach an efficient allocation where the, uh, either party can buy up the uh, other party if, if it compensates, if the uh, gains from the uh, allocation is efficient. Okay, now. Do they go to a court? Are there laws of compensation which they follow? Huh? Do they engage a lawyer to negotiate on their behalf? Are there judges in the court who administer justice? Who pays the salaries of all these people? Who pays the training of the, all these people? No, you can't have extra cost, I mean not extra cost and yet have allocation. Somebody has to pay for the training of the judge. Somebody has to pay for the legislators making the legislations for making the laws. Somebody has to pay for all the paper on which it is printed. Somebody has to pay for the nearest police station where you can lodge a complaint. You know, in other words, these are all called quotient transaction costs, isn't it? So, the society as a whole, it is true that the market can take care of quotient transaction costs, 
but the society has to provide for these costs and they can be recover, recovered from the market through the process of taxation. Am I right? So, this is quotient externalities which are very different from an externality of the Piguvian variety. Quotient externalities are institutional, they are defined around the institution of property and the political and economic institutions that govern the country. No? Okay. This is another extension of neoclassical economics happening as far away as 1960 not just Marshall's time, but 1960 Robert Coase University of Chicago writes about this. Then pricing of utilities, we have talked about one pricing of utilities already. Do you recall last week there was even a diagram really what about Dupuy, you remember Dupuy the Frenchman, how do you price, how do you charge a tariff on people who want to cross a bridge, you do not remember this, I even had a nice little drawing I thought, <laughs> well anyway so um, Dupuy was very early in discussing pricing of utilities, in other words uh, how do you price utilities so that the social gain is the maximum and Dupuy said that if you price it according to marginal utility because marginal utility declines as people used it more and more as the price keeps falling with marginal utility the social gain net social gain from public utility will be the highest because that is like a rent consumer surplus. Dupuy did not know about consumer surplus, but it is it amounts to that the social consumer surplus. So, the earliest utility pricing was a marginalist explanation is what I am trying to say. Much later the subject grew intensely by the 1970s there were theories of utility pricing which says you must price it according to marginal cost or you must price it according to average cost or you must price it according to marginal cost plus margin all kinds of theories including in the 1990s in the Indian Econometrics Association there was a fascinating paper which was a computer simulation model on all kinds of factors which influenced utility, utility prices and how the tariff will change if, we, if you keep changing and fiddling around with all these other factors. So, it did not even have marginal cost marginal revenue. So, utility pricing became a big issue things like electricity pricing how do you charge people for electricity how do you charge people for using a public transportation system, how do you charge, how do you charge people for using highways, how do you determine the toll and so on and so it is a big issue all of them became later day developments of neoclassical economics. But you know the earliest version of this is by Dupuy. Okay. Then have you heard of shadow pricing? You have I am sure what is that got to do with planning because I have said planning shadow pricing. It is a, it is a how do you shadow pricing deals with precisely how you fix this cost, it is not real it is a virtual cost, how do you fix it? Great example, the government for insurance purposes on agriculture suppose wants to create an insurance policy for farmers. Hmm. So, they want to determine the cost of growing paddy and earnings from growing paddy, so that they can estimate net returns and, and also the risk attached to it and therefore, determine some premium. So, in estimating the cost of cultivating paddy they might simply ask how many people did you hire from the market for working on your farm the mat might say well 10 people at 100 rupees each say 1000 rupees. Another person might say sir I hired 10 people at uh, 100 rupees each, but I did uh, 20 days of work myself me my wife my family did it. So, 20 days of 3 people is 60 days of work at 100 rupees that is 6000 rupees. 
but putting that 6000 rupees on the value of their service is shadow price. That is you fix a value on a non market transaction as if it is a market transaction, so that you can account for it. Right? That is what planning is all about. There are many there are many times when you cannot use actual market prices for doing proper planning estimates. You have got to have shadow prices and so shadow pricing is an important part of planning. Although planning is a non market activity, the whole derivation of shadow prices is a market based activity. So, that is again a very interesting area. Then economics of political and social institutions is a huge terrain. Gary Baker has a lovely paper which became immensely popular economic theory of marriage immensely popular. Gary Becker in University of Chicago is also known as professor of sociology, because he explains a lot of sociological phenomena through a utility maximizing paradigm constraint maximization. So, Gary Becker has talked about marriages and divorces, he has talked about crime, he has talked about justice, everything is a utility maximizing exercise if you look at it that way. So, George Stigler had a theory of economic regulation with interest groups. He says, well look, how does the government create a policy of regulation? And he says, the policy of regulation is created because some people are wanting that regulation, they are lobbying for it. So, they catch hold of the nearest legislator whom they can get hold of and pursue him and persuade him that he should campaign for them in the senate. And the legislator himself is interested in doing this, because he might get a little trade off in the process. So, the, the legislator is gaining some payment, he is expanding, expanding his effort in campaigning for a particular legislation. And eventually when the legislation happens, the interests of the people who are looking for this legislation are benefited. So, each one is trying to maximize his gains from a particular activity, but regulation economic regulation happens as a process of this. So, this is the economic theory of regulation by George Stigler. In 1996 I think there was a paper in uh, if you care to look for it, there was a paper uh, in uh, journal of quantitative economics, which comes out of Delhi school of economics called a theory of quasi autonomous state, which went much further than Stigler and said that the state under the influence of interest groups had gains to make or were, was, was determined its decisions were determined by various interest groups through lobbying activity. So, members of the state made money in creating legislation and had to make compromises in the process of making legislation. So, eventually the state itself is not autonomous from the market, the state itself is a little bit of the market. So, bargaining and uh, negotiating across the board often times lead to state creating legislations, but this happens almost as if it happens in the market. And here the state is not autonomous, but only quasi it appears to be autonomous from the system, but it is actually very much part of the system. So, this was a paper in that journal at that time. Point I am making is there is a whole lot of issues which are institutional, which are political institutional, which are social, all of which are now coming within the ambit. For example, cooperation is a major issue studied under constraint maximization exercise. Under what conditions can I, can two people cooperate in a con, in a competitive situation? So, what are the gains if we cooperate? What are the gains if we compensate? Way if we compete? If the gains of cooperation are higher than the gains of competition, then we'd rather cooperate. Then, how long will we cooperate? Again, that depends upon the how. What is the time periodicity of the gains from cooperation? In short, again, constraint maximization takes you to decide how people cooperate, how people collude and so on and so forth. 
other studies have gone in to say how do village communities operate, what is the secret of cohesiveness of village community. These communities seem to have strong rules which they follow and there is strong discipline and therefore very little of course in transaction cost, right. Hardly any money spent on constituting uh, the judiciary this that, but the communities seem to work very well. So, number of studies of such communities were increasingly mathematically made till finally people came to an understanding that the size of the community had something to do with how effective the communities were. The smaller the communities the more cohesive they were and therefore more effective in this way. The larger the communities the less effective they were in this way. So, again the size of the factor is important. I am suggesting all these things to you because since the time of Marshall neoclassical economics as applications of a constraint maximization exercise have gone a long long way. However, this constraint maximization approach again has two components. One the Walrasian component which is general equilibrium and the Marshallian component which is partial equilibrium. Most macroeconomic policy studies which are not Keynesian assume that there is some general equilibrium in the background and they work on that assumption. If I remember I had even told you once that uh, one of the Indian plans the 10th 5 year plan I think was had something like uh, 70 or 80 sectors in a computable general equilibrium frame. So, uh, it has tremendous applications again across the place. All this growth was a period also hampered by the development of another kind of universal another kind of theory. By the 1920s it appeared to the western world that markets had failed. There were so many catastrophes happening in the 1920s not that they did not happen earlier for instance between 1879 and 80 to about 1895 there was a continuous period of crisis in the west which was called a great depression. But quite aside from all that it is in the 1920s that it appeared to people that the markets have failed. Then people were looking for an alternative way of looking at economic processes and a new discipline was born modern macroeconomics. Neither general equilibrium nor partial equilibrium appear to give you a substantial answer to many questions which were raised in areas where the market seemed to have failed. So, from 1920s came debates initially based on things like gold standard, but substantially later looking at policies and interventions by government which would stabilize the economy during times of underemployment, during times of inflation. In other words the whole focus of economics shifted in the 1930s between 1925 and the late 30s from partial equilibrium and general equilibrium to macroeconomics and the founder of which branch at that time was John Maynard Keynes. So, on Saturday we shall look at Keynes's universals and how they came to rule the thought of not just Cambridge England, but lot of England and almost all of Europe up to 1960s. And it looked as if from the 1960s Keynes was no longer relevant. The non Keynesian pro neoclassical group uh, appeared to succeed, but once again with the crisis of US recently in the last 5, 6 years and the crisis of Europe along with it and Japan it looks as if more and more significantly people are thinking on Keynesian lines. So, let us look at that in Saturday we are done for today.